Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you, Dave. This is Mars, the red planet. Here's a closer view with one of NASA's incredible rovers. Renowned mathematician and theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking says threats to the Earth are so dire that we need to prepare to escape to Mars or even farther. I share Professor Hawking's concerns about threats to the Earth, but I think we should assume that our descendants won't have anywhere else to live besides right here. Now, I don't mean that NASA won't send astronauts to Mars or that we shouldn't explore space or anything like that. I just mean I think that it would be prudent to assume that everyone in future generations, aside from perhaps a few explorers, will live right here. If I'm right about that, we ought to take care of this planet. Besides, who wants to go to Mars? I'd rather be here. <laughs> here, it's pretty nice outside, it's pretty. You don't need an oxygen tank to go outside. You don't need a space suit. And if you rip your clothes when you're outside, it's an annoyance, it's not a life-threatening catastrophe. <laughs> so I'm gonna try to make three points. First, I'm gonna explain why I think it would be wise to assume that our descendants the bulk of people in the future will live right here on this planet. And I'll argue, therefore, that we ought to look after the life support capacity of this planet. And then finally, my main point is I'll argue that lately in the United States, we have not been doing a good job of that because we've been tricked. We've been tricked into rejecting good environmental protection ideas on the basis of biased tests and double standards that we would know better than to, to uh, accept in other circumstances. So I hope that after you hear this talk, these biased tests and double standard arguments will jump out at you and you'll point them out to other people and you'll help your nation and your society make better environmental decisions. But first, why do I think we shouldn't assume that we'll be able to go to Mars? Well, for several reasons. The first is the least of my concerns, but it's still a, a relevant concern. We don't have the transportation technology for people. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if NASA overcomes that, but I wouldn't bet everybody's future on it either. A second reason is space travel is remarkably expensive. This is the International Space Station. It's 250 miles up. Believe it or not, the United States pays Russia $80 million to get one astronaut back and forth to the International Space Station, $80 million. The biggest building on this campus and it's a big, beautiful building, costs a little more than $30 million to build, so less than half as much. Meanwhile, as you know, we have more than 7 billion brothers and sisters on this planet, billions of whom live on a few dollars a day or less. They can't afford a short taxi ride, let alone a ride on a spaceship. And the more fortunate, more fortunate among us are not providing for their basic needs to be met in all cases. It seems unlikely that we're going to pay for their space travel. This high expense of space travel is presumably why even enthusiasts like Professor Hawking imagine that only a couple of thousand people could ever go anywhere else. A couple of thousand people is roughly one in a million people. That won't do much good for the literally thousands of millions who would be left behind. Another reason I think we ought to assume that our descendants will live right here is because we don't know how to make self-sustaining ecosystems out of big dead rocks. So <laughs> this, diagram, this diagram is meant to show Mars becoming like Earth, not literally, but taking on the self-sustaining ecosystem property unique to our planet. Ecosystems are incredibly complex. We know some things that will destroy them. We know maybe some of their requirements, but the gaps in our understanding of ecosystems are vast. We have no idea how to make ecosystems, self-sustaining ecosystems, out of non-living components. In fact, we can't even make a single living cell out of non-living components, so I don't think we should bet our descendants' future on the, on the ability to overcome this challenge. Another reason I don't think we should count on going to Mars is the reason to escape to Mars, and keep in mind, I'm not talking about exploring or NASA sending some astronauts, but escaping en masse to Mars is because the reason to do so would be because we've caused so much damage to this planet. In other words, we've failed to sustain the life support capacity of this planet. But to go to Mars and succeed on Mars, we would not only have to manufacture life support capacity on Mars, 
we would also have to sustain that life support capacity. But if we can't do it here, what reason is there to think we could do it there? I can't see any reason. So if we can sustain the life support capacity here, we ought to just do that where everybody will benefit. And if we can't sustain the life support capacity here, it's not going to do any good to go to Mars because we won't be able to sustain it there either. So a, friend of, a younger friend of mine, I don't know much about video games, I'm too old, but <laughs> a younger friend of mine said, sustaining the life support capacity of Earth, that's like beating the video game on easy mode, but creating ecosystems on Mars and sustaining those, that's like trying to beat the video game on expert or, or maybe even impossible mode. So I think the obvious conclusion is not to damage the life support capacity of this planet. Well, how are we doing in that regard? <laughs> not very well. There are millions, literally millions of people doing great work, and there are all kinds of minor victories, but the major trends are in the wrong direction. We are depleting forests, depleting fisheries, depleting aquifers, depleting the soil. We're changing the chemical composition of both the atmosphere and the oceans and causing climate change. And maybe most pro profoundly of all, we're depleting biodiversity and the ecosystems upon which both we and that biodiversity depend. The trends are in the wrong decision. There must be something terribly wrong with our decisions. We're de damaging the life support capacity of the only place in the universe known to support life. Now, we haven't always made bad decisions. My parents' generation, the grandparents of the students in the audience, made some very good decisions. This is a graph of the number of major environmental laws passed in the United States per decade since the 1950s. And what you see is the 1960s, 70s, and 80s were the heyday of passing environmental laws. Some of you who are younger may not even realize what these laws did. This is a picture of air pollution in Beijing today. Believe it or not, American cities looked like this in the 50s and 60s, but they don't anymore thanks to one of those laws, the Clean Air Act. Likewise, incredibly, rivers used to be so polluted in many American cities that they literally caught fire. But they don't anymore, thanks to the Clean Water Act. So these laws worked. But something has happened since then. Since the 1990s, this country has passed no major environmental laws. There has been no major progress during the lifetimes of today's students, even graduate students in some cases. Well. Environmental protection threatens profits of environmentally damaging activities. And some, certainly by no means all, but some people whose, whose profits are threatened therefore object to environmental protection. And what's happened since then is they've tricked us into not passing any laws. See, they can't argue that environmental protection is a bad idea or that damage to the planet is a good thing. Nobody's going to buy that. And they can't argue that their profits are more important in the planet. Nobody's going to buy that. So they have to take a different approach. And the approach they've taken is to work behind the scenes to manipulate public debate. And they do this several ways. I have time to talk about four ways that we've been tricked. And for short, to help you remember them, I'm going to refer to them as certainty, freedom, jobs, and profit. Let's begin with certainty. No matter how good our understanding of an environmental problem, Opponents of environmental protection will argue that we just don't understand it well enough to act. This has been going on with regard to climate change for decades, even though well over 90% of qualified scientists think we do understand it well enough to act. In, this is a double standard. In other circumstances, we understand the danger of putting off decisions indefinitely. If you're ill, if one of your loved ones is ill, you go to the physician, you expect the physician to analyze the situation carefully, examine the patient, run the necessary tests, and come up with a treatment plan, but not put off years and years and years before deciding what to do, running more and more and more tests, because the patient could die in the meantime, right? Students in the room, I hope you cho considered your college choice options carefully, but what you didn't do is you didn't spend years and years and years at home after high school studying colleges in more and more gruesome detail, <laughs> right? If, you, if my sons had done that, guess what? They'd be home, I'd be driving them crazy, right? And if everybody did that, all the colleges and universities would have closed, right? Because everybody would be home studying. So, not studying, studying, studying colleges. So, so, in normal circumstances, we understand that delay and indecision is dangerous and has a cost. But when it comes to environmental issues, 
we get paralyzed. We've made this mistake over and over. We've made this mistake for a long time with regard to stratospheric ozone depletion and with regard to acid rain and with regard to the health effects of smoking for decades, right? The, the, by the way, the history of this is really well documented in a book called Merchants of Doubt by Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway. So we're making this mistake now with climate change. This is a double standard. In other circumstances, we know we can't delay decisions until we have perfect understanding. We need to make decisions in a timely fashion. But with regard to environmental problems, we get paralyzed. Another flawed argument that has been used as a basis for rejecting good environmental ideas are appeals to freedom. When environmental protection is proposed, opponents will argue that it would infringe upon freedom. And they're right. It would infringe upon one type of freedom. It would infringe upon freedom to damage the environment. <laughs> they never seem to mention that it would do so in order to protect freedom from environmental damage. So environmental protection works exactly like the prohibition on smoking in this room. Because of that prohibition, we're all free to breathe clean air. So when you hear appeals to freedom, ask yourself, is the speaker or the writer only considering freedom to damage the environment, or are they considering all the relevant freedoms? Freedom to damage the environment, but freedom for everybody from environmental damage. We make exactly the same mistake with regard to jobs. When environmental protection is proposed, opponents will argue that jobs would be lost in affected industries. Nowadays, one hears this most often with regard to attempts to shift to clean renewable energy sources. Opponents argue this is a, disparage this as a war on coal, a war on coal. Well, I don't mean to make light of lost jobs. However, in that particular instance, for example, there are already more jobs in the solar energy industry than in the coal industry, right? So if somebody is really motivated by jobs, they ought to be an enthusiast for solar power. Again, this is a double standard. The folks that object to environmental protection don't object to other societal developments and initiatives that cause job losses. For example, they don't object to entrepreneurship or technological innovation, but entrepreneurship and technological innovation lead to new products and new industries which make old products obsolete and put old industries out of business. But you won't hear any complaints about that. Just jobs lost from environmental protection, even if more jobs are being created as a result of the environmental protection. And the last one of these double standards that I'd like to mention is insistence that environmental protection turn a short-term profit, as if it were, say, a business investment in uh, expanding a toy factory or a smartphone app. Now, sometimes environmental protection does turn a short-term profit. For example, this college, Austin College, has cut its greenhouse gas emissions by nearly half over the last several years, nearly half. In the course of doing that, we've saved almost, not quite, but almost a half a million dollars a year. Well, how is that possible? Well, you see, in part of the way we've cut the greenhouse gas emissions is to learn to use energy more efficiently in running the buildings. And so we don't have to buy as much energy. And because we don't have to buy as much energy, we save money. So we've cut our greenhouse gas emissions and saved money at the same time. It wasn't even very hard. But we, good environmental protection ideas can be rejected if they're required to have an immediate cash profit like that. Often, societal, important societal de decisions require an upfront investment and then a payoff over the long term. It's, again, this is a double standard. We don't expect major decisions in other contexts to turn a short-term profit. We don't expect grade schools to turn a short-term profit. We don't expect basic medical research to turn a short-term profit. We certainly don't expect space exploration to turn a short-term profit. If we did, only wealthy children would have schools to go to and we wouldn't do any basic medical research or cure any diseases, and we wouldn't be talking about whether we could escape to Mars because we wouldn't do any space exploration. <laughs> so this is a fourth double standard. So I've talked about four objections that are used as a basis for rejecting good environmental protection ideas. Fortunately, my parents' generation didn't fall for these arguments, or our cities would still look like Beijing does today. So my uh, task for you is to watch for these arguments. When you hear them, point them out to others, because as long as these tricks continue to work, we'll continue to fail to make good environmental decisions and continue to grind away at the planet's life support capacity. But once the tricks no longer work, environmental protection progress will resume. So I want to leave you with 
two final thoughts. The first one is, this is actually good news. We could make a great deal of progress if we would simply reject biased arguments and double standards and thereby make wiser decisions. And finally, I think our country could use some sort of noble challenge to get behind. And I can't think of anything better than leaving our descendants, all of our descendants, and everybody's descendants a healthy planet. Thank you.